Tsunamis are part of Australia's history. Even though the continent is largely protected from them due to its location, with it lying in the middle of a stable tectonic plate, there is still evidence of large tsunamis hitting the mainland. The generation of tsunamis isn't only limited to large earthquakes. Submarine landslides and asteroid impacts that land in the open ocean can generate massive tsunamis that can be tall enough to ride over significant cliff faces and surge multiple kilometres inland. As you will soon see, the wave we will discuss in today's video reached heights of at least 130 meters or 426.5 feet. If you've watched our video on the Burkle impact event, I went all around the southern and western parts of Australia documenting the mega tsunami deposits left over by the massive wave that inundated much of the land following a comet impact in the Indian Ocean. And I offered compelling evidence of the depositions left over by this event. The link to this video will be down in the description. In today's video, we're turning to the eastern parts of Australia. Tsunami evidence exists in both New South Wales and Queensland, but we'll be focusing on the wave damage in New South Wales in this episode. I'll be drawing much of my information from a paper that was released in 2001 under the title Geological Indicators of Large Tsunami in Australia. The link to this peer-reviewed paper will be in the description. We'll be starting our journey in Jervis Bay, which is nestled along the southeastern coast of New South Wales in Australia. The mega tsunami waves at Jervis Bay were capable of travelling up to 10 kilometres inland, reaching elevations of more than 80 metres above sea level. The extensive inland penetration combined with the deposition of large boulders and the formation of chevron dunes underscores the immense power of these ancient waves. Their study details the geological signatures left behind by these monumental waves, offering a glimpse into the ancient forces that shaped Jervis Bay. One of the most compelling pieces of evidence of these mega tsunamis is found in the massive boulders strewn across the landscape. At Gumgetters Inlet, for example, Dr. Bryant discovered sandstone slabs measuring up to 7 meters in diameter, deposited at an elevation of 25 meters above the sea level. These boulders, many exceeding 2 meters in intermediate diameter, are not the result of ordinary storm waves. Their imbricated or stacked arrangement suggests they were carried and deposited by powerful forces of tsunami waves. The velocity required to transport such massive boulders is staggering, estimated to range from 7.8 to 10.3 meters per second. These findings underscore the immense energy unleashed by the tsunamis, capable of lifting and suspending huge boulders and depositing them high above the current sea level. Such boulder deposits provide a stark insight into the destructive power of these ancient waves. At Steamers Beach, located on the southern headland of Jervis Bay, lies another intriguing feature. Chevron Dunes. These parabolic dunes, consisting of sand mixed with cobbles, rise from the beach to a height of 30 meters. A second deposit of sand, fine shell hash, muddy lenses and quartz pebbles forms parabolic dunes up to 130 meters or 427 feet high behind the beach. These formations, known as chevrons, a word many of you are familiar with if you watched the Burkle Impact documentary that we made, are created by the run-up of sediment-laden tsunami waves leaving behind distinct V-shaped ridges pointing inland. Despite their prominence in geological surveys, these chevrons are not easily visible on standard satellite imagery or maps. They've been heavily obscured by vegetation, making them less distinct from the air. However, their presence is unmistakable to trained geologists, who recognize these formations as clear indicators of past tsunami activity. The height of these chevrons indicates that the waves responsible for their formation were at least 130 meters, if not higher. Beyond the deposits, the erosional signatures left by these mega tsunamis are equally telling. Large-scale features such as linear canyon formations, pool and cascade features, and raised ramps on headlands reveal the sculpting power of the waves. For instance, at Jervis Bay, the breaking of tsunami waves left behind inverted toothbrush-like structures, with raised ramps separated from the shoreline by eroded depressions. As a side note, if you're enjoying this video, please click the like button to help YouTube recommend it to others. Consider subscribing and clicking the bell icon to be notified of when we upload. We also have a Patreon if you'd like to support the channel, only if you have the means of course, and you can find that both in the description and in the pinned comment down below. Smaller features such as Muschelbruch, Sichuanen, Cavetos, and Flutes further illustrate the high velocity flows that carve the bedrock, akin to the erosional features seen in subglacial environments or mega flood regions. Muschelbruch, Sichuanen, and Cavetos are specific types of erosional features formed by high-velocity flows, such as those associated with tsunamis. 
These terms are used to describe distinct bedrock sculpturing patterns resulting from the intense energy and dynamics of such events. Muschelbruch is a German term meaning shall break, and it refers to the scallop shaped depressions or grooves carved into the bedrock. These features are created by the turbulent flow of water, which erodes the rock surface in a pattern resembling the concave shape of a shell. They are typically formed by processes involving cavitation and abrasion. Sichelwannen, another German term, translates to sickle troughs. These are crescent shaped depressions or troughs carved into the bedrock by the erosive action of fast moving water. These features form when water flows over bedrock with sufficient force to create curved, sickle like troughs. Unfortunately, very little pictures available for me to use exist to demonstrate these phenomena. The shape results from the consistent direction and velocity of the flow. Cavettos are small concave depressions or grooves found on bedrock surfaces, often created by the erosive action of swirling water or cavitation. Cavettos form when water carrying sediments and debris flows over rock surfaces with high velocity. The swirling motion of the water creates small rounded indentations in the rock. Understanding what triggered these ancient mega tsunamis is crucial. The study by Dr. Bryant and Dr. Knott points to two primary causes. Large submarine landslides on the continental slope and meteorite impacts in the adjacent ocean. These forces are capable of generating the enormous energy required to produce waves of such magnitude. Submarine landslides, often triggered by seismic activity, can displace vast amounts of water, creating massive waves. Meanwhile, the impact of a meteorite crashing into the ocean or even exploding above it can produce tsunami waves with run-up heights between 10 and 100 or more meters. Aboriginal stories recounting meteorite impacts adds a cultural dimension to this geological narrative, suggesting that these cataclysmic events have left a lasting imprint on both the land and its people. Radiocarbon dating and other methods have provided a timeline for these catastrophic events. Evidence indicates that at least two significant mega tsunamis occurred during the last 1000 years. The most recent event, estimated to have occurred around 350 to 400 years ago, left behind deposits and erosional features that match those found in other regions of Australia. This event is believed to have had a substantial impact on the coastline, with waves overtopping cliffs up to 80 metres high and sweeping boulders inland. Another major event, dated to around 750 to 1050 years ago, similarly left its mark, with boulders and chevrons indicating the immense power of these waves. These timelines suggest a recurring pattern of large-scale tsunamis, possibly linked to regional seismic activity or periodic meteorite impacts. The evidence of mega tsunamis at Jervis Bay is not merely of academic interest, it highlights the ongoing risks posed by such events to coastal communities. While the historic record of the last two centuries shows no comparable events, the geological record indicates that Australia is not immune to the devastating effects of tsunamis. Understanding the past is crucial for preparing for potential future events. The geological evidence of mega tsunamis is complemented by the rich tapestry of Aboriginal oral traditions. Indigenous communities along the southeastern coast of Australia have long told stories of great waves and the forces of nature that shape their world. These narratives, passed down through generations, offer valuable insights into the historical occurrence of tsunamis and their impact on human societies. One such story speaks of a time when the sea rose up in anger, flooding the land and carrying away everything in its path. The elders described waves as tall as the highest trees, sweeping inland and reshaping the landscape. These accounts, while often dismissed as myth, align closely with the geological evidence uncovered by modern science. The integration of Aboriginal stories with geological findings creates a more holistic understanding of the history of mega tsunamis. It acknowledges the deep connection between the land and its people, recognizing that cultural memory can serve as a vital repository of historical knowledge. This interdisciplinary approach enriches our comprehension of past events and highlights the importance of preserving indigenous narratives as part of our collective heritage. The study on Jervis Bay's mega tsunami reveals that the direction of the tsunami waves was primarily from the southeast. This conclusion is based on several geological indicators observed in the region. The boulders found along the clifftops and within the bay are imbricated in a manner that indicates a southeast source. This stacking pattern aligns with the direction from which the waves approached, showing that the force of water was coming from the southeast. The chevrons at Steamers Beach, which rise to 130 metres or 427 feet in height, are orientated in a way that also points to a southeast origin. These V-shaped ridges indicate the flow direction of the sediment-laden waves, 
confirming the southeast approach of the tsunami. We will now look at any additional evidence that exists. Remember, we are looking for a wave that hit from the southeast. One thing seems clear to me, and that is the fact that unlike the Burkle impact event and subsequent mega tsunami, this wave appears to be localized rather than massively widespread. Whether a small impact occurred just off the coastline here or a submarine landslide took place is debatable. But the evidence of this event isn't quite as widespread as the Burkle Chevron deposits. But that could be because of the dense vegetation that exists here. This level of vegetation doesn't exist in the parts of Australia covered during the Burkle impact. But the wave was much taller than the 130 odd meters approximated in this event. There are a few things that stand out though. The first is this line of vegetative regrowth that has occurred in Five Mile Beach. You can see a clear outline of where the tsunami appears to have hit at its most powerful level. A little south of here you can see wave damage and chevron depositions at Kudmura Beach. The next point that they appear at is further south at Inyata Beach. And they appear again at Conjola Beach. After this, as we travel further south, we have multiple townships that have developed which may have erased any trace of the tsunami impact. The last spot that pokes out to me is at Wairo Beach. But there's one last thing that really stood out to me and that's the fluted features that appear in the cliff sides further south beginning at Emily Miller Beach and extending all the way down until North Head Beach. Just look at these features on Google Satellite. They are carved in a manner that suggests the wave hit from the southeast. I'll put a few of these locations up on the screen now. So I hope you enjoyed this look into a mega tsunami that struck New South Wales. In the coming days, I'll release a video on the wave damage and tsunami deposition in Queensland that this paper that we are covering discusses. So until then, thanks for watching. Are you interested in animals? I've just started a second channel called Paleozoology that discusses extinct and extant animals with a current focus on the megafauna that once dominated and roamed Australia. I've released a video on the marsupial lion which existed in Australia during the time Indigenous Australians walked the continent. I've also covered the wombat that was the size of a car, known as the Diprotodon, or the largest terrestrial lizard known as the Megalania. I'd love to have you along for the journey as more videos are released. You can find a link to this channel and to the aforementioned videos in the description and in the pinned comment in the comment section. Before I end this video, I'd like to give a big shout out to my Patreon and YouTube members. Thank you so much to everyone that helps to support this channel.